Dr. Isaac Turgeman, clinical neuropsychologist and assistant professor here at Albizu Miami campus. And I'll be your host and moderator for this Albizu University webinar as we explore the nature of conflict and relationships and the clash between the messages we get from our head and those that we get from our heart. I'd like to begin by introducing you to our three panelists, my colleagues here at Albizu Miami campus and experts in this area. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tanya Diaz. So hello, Happy Dr. Diaz. Here. Happy to be here, thank you. So welcome, we're excited to have you here. Uh, Dr. Diaz is a licensed psychologist and qualified um, board approved clinical supervisor for mental health counselors and heart math certified trainer. She is also the program coordinator for mental health counseling students at Albizu University, where she teaches graduate courses and supervises student clinicians. Dr. Diaz focuses on the importance of mental health hygiene, heart rhythm technology, and self-care. In addition, she has a boutique private practice in Miami Lakes. Today, Dr. Diaz will take us on will talk to us about relational conflicts and resolution. Next, let's welcome Dr. Jessica Popham. So, Hi everyone, thank you. So welcome. Thank you. So great to have you here. Dr. Popham is a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Florida. She's also a full-time faculty member and practicum coordinator for marriage and family therapy students at Albies Universities master's in psychology program. Her specialty topics include anxiety, trauma, depression, parenting, grief and loss, and family dynamics. Dr. Popham's focus today will be on intergenerational family dynamics. And our third panelist is Dr. Scott Bauer. So welcome, Dr. Bauer. Thank you. Good day. Good day. So he has formal training in neuropsychology, behavioral medicine, and psychopharmacology, and is a pediatric mental health provider with over 25 years of education, clinical training, and clinical work experience. Dr. Bauer is an Albizu alumnus and now is a full-time faculty member for the master's department serving as professor and clinical practicum supervisor. He has been working with Albizu's master's in psychology program for more than 10 years as a professor and also has a private practice in Coral Gables, Florida. His specific interests include neuropsychopharmacology, physiological psychology, and the brain behavior relationship. All right, so as you can see, we have a great panel of experts uh, to address this area from all different angles. Now, our plan is to hear from our panelists first and then save the last few minutes for questions from our audience. And as the discussion proceeds, please submit your questions to everyone through the Zoom chat function, okay? So let's begin by putting today's discussion into context. After a full year of navigating the COVID pandemic and all the disruption uh, and, comfort and discomfort it has caused, there's likely no shortage of negative relationship issues and interpersonal conflict whether it's politics, religion, child rearing, finances, and any other issue that causes a rift, uh, what should couples do when their perspectives collide? So Dr. Diaz, I'd like to begin with you. Can you give us some insight into what the term mental health hygiene is all about and how couples can work together to ensure that they take care of their family's mental health hygiene? Sure, sure, Dr. T. So, um, you know, mental health hygiene is not unlike daily hygiene, you know, where you get up in the morning, you do your basic routines, you brush your teeth. Why do you brush your teeth in order to prevent any type of tooth decay or deterioration, right? Well, the same principle applies to mental health, you know? It's a preventative measure in order to ensure any type of deterioration of your emotional or psychological functioning. Its goal is basically to promote stability, to improve your quality of life. Now, I'll give you a couple of statistics. For example, we have like approximately 264 million people diagnosed with depression, which by the way, is the leading cause of disability worldwide. And in most cases, or in some cases, depression leads into suicide, which happens to be the second leading cause of death between the ages of 15 and 29. So Dr. T, it's really simple. 
you know, people who are performing well mentally, you know, they have more energy, they have more focus, they're happier, they have better relationships, they have better sex lives, they're more productive. You see, it's an overall win-win and it's everybody's responsibility, you see. So if you truly care about your family, you're going to take measures to ensure, okay, that everybody is practicing good mental health hygiene. Now I can go ahead and I can give a couple of tips now or later, however you wish. No, I, I think it'd be good. Uh, I, I like the way that you're framing mental health rather than it's something that we should try to resolve when there's an issue, we should look at it as everyday hygiene. Uh, like you mentioned, we brush our teeth, we take care of our bodies on an everyday basis. Why not treat mental health the same way? So uh, I think myself and the audience would be very interested if you could give us a few tips on how we can make mental health hygiene part of our everyday lives. Yeah, sure, sure, I'll be happy to. The first thing is you gotta take care of your basic needs and sleep is paramount. Okay, so getting a good night's sleep is not to be underestimated. So how do you go about that? Okay, the first thing is try to establish like a regular bedtime routine. Okay, the brain loves routine. So if you set a particular time, same time to go to bed, it's easier for you to fall asleep. Second thing is minimize to no alcohol because what alcohol does, it interferes with that respiratory sleep, that stage four sleep, okay? And another tip is stop looking at the screens, whether it be a computer screen, whether it be, uh, you know, your, your iPhone, your iPad, because those screens, they kind of emit blue light, you see. And then the blue light tricks the brain. It tricks the brain into thinking that they're awake. And so it finds it harder to relax. The next thing is a lot of people, they go to sleep, Isaac, and they end up thinking about, okay, what's my checklist to do for tomorrow? So engaging in the breath and staying in the present moment and trying to just give the body an opportunity to relax is paramount. You know, another tip is exercise with this pandemic. Some people, you know, have stopped going to the gym, for example, you see. So even if you can go out and just get a little bit of exercise because blood flow to the brain has been shown to improve your mood and even job performance. And last but not least, don't remain isolated tap your social support systems. So if you're gonna use that tablet, go ahead and reach out to someone. You're gonna go physically, as long as you're kind of practicing those kind of universal precautions, okay? But just interact and reach out to those people that care about you. Because at the end of the day, Dr. T, there's no health without mental health. So mental health hygiene is basically just life hygiene, being yeah. healthy individuals, whether it means exercising, or trying to live a bit more structured lives and ensuring that we pay attention to things like sleep and our daily regimens. Um, so very important. And, I, and that comment about time away from the screen, obviously wait until this webinar is over before you start <laughs> doing that. But I think that's very important because in our daily lives, our cell phones seem to be almost anatomically attached to us nowadays. And when we put those down, we go onto the tablets you mentioned or even our TV screens. The ripple effect, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes all at once. Um, <laughs> so it becomes very interesting. But um, addressing relationships, um, what happens when a couple has opposing views? Uh, how can they learn to really listen to one another, understand the other's point of view, uh, when maybe they don't see mental health hygiene the same way, or even prioritize it the same way? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Because a lot of times when couples reach what we call an impasse, and this is where they're knocking heads and nobody's willing to budge. This is when, you know, we advocate for, you know, communicating through the eyes of compassion. Okay. And actually research has denoted that, you know, when people use compassion, uh, what happens is that oxytocin, which is, um, you know, a hormone, it's released from the body. Yeah, and this kind of emits feelings of calm, safety, and connectedness. This is like the feel good hormone, okay? Um, you wanna be able to stop focusing on your own thoughts and feelings and really try to get curious about your partner's underlying feelings about their particular position. So listening, not to be validated or invalidated is not the goal here. Listening to understand. Okay, and to really, really hear what your partner is trying to convey and their worries and their concern, because that, that is where the shit happens. Because the moment that somebody feels understood, 
They are more tolerant about their own personal struggles and even more tolerant to hear somebody else's opinion because they feel that they are being heard themselves, you see? So that, that is ultimately the goal, to kind of identify the unit as a team and recognize that you're not on opposing sides. On the contrary, everybody, everybody has the same goal because nobody would intentionally endanger their family or put anybody at risk. And so the focus really is on how to, how can you help each other get through this, you say, as opposed to who's right and who's wrong, okay. finding the ground. Well, I like that very much. It's kind of the slogan for this past year has been, we're all in this together. And even if you have different points of views regarding social distancing, vaccination, or even other COVID related matters, it's important to not just hear, but listen and validate the other person, even if their point of view is not the same as yours. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Diaz. That's Dr. Very- I just want to make something real clear. It's, sure. it's not it's not about feeling the same way about the topic, Mm -hmm. okay? But it's about learning about the person's emotional landscape where they fall on the spectrum. I just wanted to end please. Thank you so much, appreciate it. And and I like that you emphasize that because like you said, it's not about being necessarily on the same page on these subject matter, but to actually care enough to try to understand their point of view and then finding the common ground. Uh, something hopefully we can all try to do in our everyday lives, but sometimes can be quite challenging. Uh, so thank you very much, Dr. Diaz. We'll definitely come back to you later today. Um, but now moving on to Dr. Popham and the same notion of finding this common ground. Um, can you talk a little bit about this uh, intergenerational occurrences? Can you tell us a little bit about what this means and how it applies to relationships and the stuff we've talked about thus far? Sure. So intergenerational, that term alone just comes from the idea that we're all part of a family. We all come from a family. And so our family includes multiple generations and our family shapes who we are, shapes what we do. And so oftentimes certain patterns and traits will get passed down through those generations and not just things genetically, but also emotionally. And so family therapists, we use this tool known as a genogram to identify these patterns and potential problems. And so a genogram is really just like a family tree. And it includes a lot of different information like age, names, important dates such as birth, death, marriage, divorce, types of relationships, and history. So substance abuse history, mental health history, medical history. And what it does, it allows us to look at our family over those uh, multiple generations and start to see some of those intergenerational occurrences that have happened in the past and might even be happening in the, in the present. So an example of what you may see from looking at a genogram, let's say you're having some relationship conflict with your partner and you're wondering where is this gonna go? What's going to happen? How do I deal with this? Through a genogram, you might notice that on your father's side, divorce has been a very common um, issue and has happened through multiple generations. And that might have been something that you kind of knew about, but you didn't really see that full pattern and how much it was actually occurring and that it might actually be repeating now in the present. And so that's how we can look at those intergenerational occurrences and be more mindful of them. Okay, so as a clinician, you have this tool, the genogram, that helps you, I guess, increase awareness to to your clients. And therefore, by becoming more aware of these patterns, then maybe they can do something about it. And that's where this intergenerational component comes into play, because it sounds like that sometimes we repeat things that previous generations do, even without knowing that we do so. Absolutely, yes. Okay, Um, I wanna stick with this idea of the family dynamic a little bit more. And we know that different members of the household oftentimes communicate very differently. And so what happens when a member of the household feels like they're being talked down to uh, and maybe uh, feels marginalized in a certain way? Uh, how can we address anger 
uh, that we might feel when a family member who is supposed to love us can potentially even be talking down to us. So what do we do in those situations? Yeah, it's a really good question. And, you know, like you said, being talked down to, it's not a pleasant thing. And it often distracts us from the real issue that needs to be addressed. And so when we feel anger, it's okay to feel that emotion, but it's really how is that emotion being expressed? And that often becomes the issue. So the best way to express emotions verbally, one way to do that is through I statements. And so these statements take a very non-blaming stance and they focus on your own feelings instead of like finger pointing to the other person. So an example of an I statement could be, I feel very sad when I am talked down to because my feelings get hurt and I feel like I'm not being respected. Okay. I like that. So Anger sounds like it's a natural response, but we should still communicate. And by using these I statements, it sounds like we're kind of owning that emotion, but not necessarily holding on to it or even denying it. And that's maybe how we can resolve some of these areas of conflict. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you very much, Dr. Palma. We will also go back to you in a little bit, but now I'd like to switch to our third panelist, Dr. Bauer. Uh, now, the primary focus of your impressive experience is neuropsychology. Can you give us a brief overview of why our nervous system and its chemistry is so closely related to our feelings? I will try. So, to simplify a complicated subject, the brain is like a computer. It controls the body functions. The nervous system is like a network that relays messages to parts of the body. The brain basically tells every other part of the body what to do all the time, whether you're aware of it or not. It controls what you think, feel, learn, remember, sense, react to, respond to, including arousal and stress and emotional and loving things. But most people don't address that because it's not a problem because they get stuck in the problem areas. The, uh, we're going to include the neuroanatomical structures and the organelles that the nervous system contributes to the hormonal system through the endocrine system, which affects our feelings, emotions, reaction, and as Dr. Popham said, behavioral responses. They're usually automatic. We have to catch them. So let's get a little deeper. The study of psychology and interaction between hormones and your endocrine system is called behavioral endocrinology. Hormones influence your behavior and emotions. The emotional reaction occurs automatically and unconsciously. Remember that, it's unconscious. So you have to bring your stuff to the awareness to even consider changing it. Emotions are complex. They react to the stimuli, whether it's internal in your own head or external, someone else or something else, especially a COVID situation. Stress, financial, hardship, just name it. Did you walk in here? Did you clean your hands? Did you wash your did you the did you clean your phone? People get a little crazy. <laughs> Not mentally crazy, just obsessive because they're worried. They're scared. Grandpa's gonna get sick. God forbid. The endocrine system produces hormones and it has a widespread effect on the body. Like neurotransmitters, hormones are chemical messengers. Let's do two positive things first. The neurotransmitters that are associated with attraction is a harmonious interaction of nice lovingness. Dopamine, norepinephrine, and even serotonin. Dopamine drives motivation. It's reward-oriented. It's goal behavior, goal-directed. It's pursuing your loved one and making them seem and feel special, exciting, and unique. Like when you first started dating them, you remember the courting process, which is thrown out the window these days? That's why they fell in love with you. They didn't marry you or love you because you were nasty and beating them. It's because you were loving them and making them feel good. Because as Dr. Diaz said, the oxytocin was coming out and you didn't realize that you were producing those things. Norepinephrine gives you an extra surge of, I'm ready for action. The energy, the racing heart, the palpitations, the stomach issue. Oh, I got butter poison in my stomach because it's norepinephrine. It's a little serotonin. It's a little, it's a little neurochemistry. And serotonin actually drops when you're in love, kind of like an OCD. I'm not calling anyone OCD when they're in love, 
an OCD patient, they have low serotonin. Now let's talk about attachment. Attachment are chemical reactions, which involves hormones. The, the previous attraction was neurotransmitters, now hormonal. Oxytocin, like Dr. Diaz said, is released during sexual intimacy. As some of you know, it's released during childbirth and, and breastfeeding for, to promote the maternal bonding. The release of this hormone may be the reason why sex is thought to bring closer, couples closer together. Val vasopressin is also a hormone that's thought to play a role in it as well, but not a lot of information on that. Now let's introduce a little neurophysiology, which involves the chemical messengers that flow back and forth from our bodies to our brain, automatically, subconsciously, unconsciously, the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response, prepares the body for sudden stress, high arousal situation. So if you're walking into your house and your spouse knows, or the kids, and you're going to be yelling at them because you're carrying that stuff. And where's dinner? What happened here? They're not going to want to be with you. They're going to run to their room. But if you walk in gently and passively and lovingly, and we're going to teach you a couple little tricks as we go further into this webinar, they're going to want to respond to you. The par parasympathetic is the rest and digest. It's more of a relaxing mode. Both are under control of the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic, automatic. You're not aware of it. Two concepts. Emotional expression is the emotion of feelings, the release, the behavior. It's depending greatly on the sympathetic nervous system. Because of why? A great deal of human interaction, the behavior, deals with social interaction. And these affect our moods and, and, and emotions which gets translated as how it comes out in behavior. Nonverbal behavior, verbal behavior, physical behavior. I'm not even getting to aggression yet. I'm not going to get into that. It actually deals, the actual, the brain and nervous system, they produce emotions. Fear, dread, isolation, loneliness, disgust, sorrow, depression, anxiety, guilt, Aggression, agitation, tension, panic, apathy, and hedonia. There's so much that you're feeling, but you don't even know why. Now, the second concept is the genesis of emotion. It involves regions like the thalamus or hypothalamus. The sympathetic nervous system, again, is reactive. It's the defensive reaction. It's very correlated with the fight or flight response. So if you're producing a fight or flight response in someone you love, something's wrong here. The neurotransmitters that are related to our thoughts, feelings, mood, and behavior, serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine. You can actually have deficiencies in serotonin. You can have deficiencies in norepinephrine. How do you identify that? Symptomatology, depressed mood, anxiety, panic, phobia, obsessions, compulsions, food cravings. You need to check. Because if you're having these things, you may have an underlying serotonin deficiency syndrome. Norepinephrine, depressed mood, problems with attention, concentrating, fatigue. These are all things that are affected. So the issue is, what's going on here? And I use the analogy. If your car's dashboard, if the light is coming on and going off, you have a problem. You're in a preventive care mode. But if it keeps coming on, and you're ignoring it, you're gonna be paying for it later. So if your light switch is coming on, you need to go to the mechanic. You need to go check it. You need to make sure that you're in a preventive care. If, you're, if your light's always on and you're screaming and yelling every night, you got something wrong with your engine, mechanically speaking. That's basically the overview, overview of nervous system and how it relates to thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Dr. T? Well, uh, as a fellow neuropsychologist, I can truly appreciate you summarizing what takes a few years of neuroanatomy and pathology into just a couple of minutes. So uh, thank you for that. Um, the complexities within our brain and our nervous system obviously um, is pretty significant. Uh, and I find it very interesting that we have all these areas involved and working at an automatic level, sometimes even outside of our awareness, yet they have so much implication 
to our everyday lives, to the behaviors that we feel like oftentimes are thought out and reasoned, but sometimes it feels like a lot of these things can be reflexive. So given that there's so much complexity and we have these internal, internal chemical imbalances and all these areas interacting, um, and I, I do wanna highlight the point that you brought up the word harmonious. It does seem like there's a harmony there. Well, what happens when the harmony is not present? Uh, what happens when the issues be, uh, go beyond the control of the cognitive and conflict resolution skills that we learn? And in other words, uh, what, at what point do we know that we need to stop trying to resolve these conflicts ourselves and realize that maybe there's a need for treatment or to bring in a professional into the situation? It's a very good question, Dr. T. Most people think it's the other problem, the person but they need to look at themselves and how they're contributing to it. They got to flip it back on them. I think it was Michael Jackson said, the man in the mirror, or the <laughs> woman in the mirror, or the person in the mirror. You got to see because you're part of the problem because fighting is easy. Solution is not. It takes work. So I would ponder a couple things for the audience. How does the individual know whether they are have an internal chemistry balance or imbalance? Well, their mood, their emotions, their reactions, their, their behavior, their, their difficulty maintaining control and things that are coming out on a regular basis. Are they crying all the time? Are they, because they're not gonna look at it if they're happy because most people don't look at things when they're good. They enjoy them. But when things are wrong, it's time to take a look at it. Are there other issues that need to be addressed? Like Dr. Diaz addressed. How's the sleep hygiene? Usually poor because we're in an addictive, electronic, let me look at this next thing and this next thing. And you can have your spouse right next to you ready for that moment that they're waiting for, but you're on your phone. Right. No, no, put it away and attend to the live thing because you need to attend to what's living and not what's mechanical. And everyone is attending to what's mechanical. So you got to see the contributing factor. Eating habits, exercise habits. Are there any underlying medical issues? All right. Are there any addiction issues? Alcohol, substance abuse, pornography, anything contributing to this? Were the relationship, was it always like this? Or did it become unstable? Was it harmonious and you're having frequent more bouts? Or is this a new problem? Or has this always been conflict and discord from day one? Huh. If that's from day one, you need to look at the relationship. Because if it's not changing as you're trying to talk it and work it through, you need to address what is going on here. And if two people can't do it together, they need an outside intervention. Is there any history of trauma or problematic relationships? And there's so many variables that we can open up, but did they carry, as Dr. Pump said, an intergenerational issue into their relationship? Did they bring their baggage into the relationship? So, okay, you're next, because they want to fight. Or they have a personality they want to fight. Or maybe they're transferring something onto you from daddy issues, mommy issues, who knows? The point is, they need to work it out with themselves. And if they can't, then they need to seek outside intervention. You can't fix your car by yourself if you're not a mechanic. You can try, but you need a professional to help you fix what you can't fix, mm -hmm. especially when things are more complex these days and you don't know what you're doing. Okay. So it sounds like if we ignore these indicator lights, sooner or later our engine is going to start smoking and pretty soon it's just going to leave us stranded and you know, no one wants that in Miami traffic. Um, now, it does sound that there's this interplay between our biology and the environment. And as has been mentioned before, intergenerational components and patterns, as well as our everyday regimen. Um, so now that we've heard from the three panelists, um, I like to show you a graphic that kind of recaps what we've discussed so far. So thank you, Dr. Bauer. Uh, that was very informative. So let's see if we can take a look at this graphic to get a little bit better idea of what we've been discussing. 
So um, basically, the, you've seen uh, so far, our different panelists have expressed that this idea of mental health awareness seems to underlie uh, basic everyday mental hygiene and overall health, whether it's being more aware of our intergenerational events, our neurobiological influences, or practicing daily mental health hygiene, or what I would like to say, just daily health practices, just being daily hygiene. So I want to bring this back to the topic at hand, as far as addressing this last year and a half or so regarding the, the changes we've all had to deal with, the increases in stress and situational factors resulting from COVID-19 and all the ensuing restrictions and effects, and bringing this back to our very own panelists as far as how this has impacted the areas we've discussed here today. So starting with uh, you, Dr. Bauer, uh, can you give us a, a brief uh, overview of how these biological aspects uh, have been impacted by the ongoing stressors related to COVID-19 and quarantine and what we can look for in regards to the future and how we can continue to cope? Basically, the whole world is in an adjustment disorder problem because they're trying to adjust to this, this pandemic globally. Very and true. then each country is adjusting to their problematic. And then each state is adjusting to their problematic. And then each family is adjusting to their problematic. And then each individual is time to adjust. So it's micro, macro to micro. Now, I work predominantly with children and the problem with kids is they can't sit in front of a computer for hours. They're not expected to do that. They're kids. We are trained to do that because we learn to do it. But you have a kid who's got disabilities. Uh, mom and dad are working. If there's, a dad in, if there's a dad in the family, maybe there's a one parent, maybe uh, someone's sick. The kids now are supposed to just sit like robots. They can't do that. So they're now playing on their phone while they're in front of the computer and they're getting yelled at because they're not paying attention and then the tension and then the tension and all of a sudden it builds. But kids are just being kids. And then dad comes home or mom comes home from work and now they're worried because they've been at work all day and they have to wear their mask and they six feet and, and, and financial hardship. Stress, and Dr. Diaz will help me on this one, stress contributes tremendously to the underlying physiology that produces how we feel and react. Dr. Diaz, sorry to put you on the spot. Sure, no, no worries, no worries. Thank you, Dr. Bauer. And by the way, Dr. Bauer, I love your analogies. And I love the fact that you take some of such a complex, you know, kind of conversation and break it down into such simple, simple terms where I'm sure most people are be able to relate at one point or another. You know, and you know, the important thing to note is that there's a lot of things that are outside of our control right now. Okay. And so the important thing is to be able to kind of categorize, well, you know, what's in our control, what's out of our control, you know. And so things that are within our control, and sometimes they could be extremely overwhelming. So, you know, research actually shows that by scheduling tasks, okay, in particular time slots, you have a sense of, you know, accomplishment and it reduces anxiety and reduces stress. You know, everybody feels good. And I don't know about anybody else, but I do my little task list. I feel good checking that off. You know, I just like, yes, one thing off my desk again and again and again. And then you have those things that are outside of your control. And those things that are outside of control, you can't control for the logistics of it, but you can focus on how we respond. And I think everybody would concur with, myself, you know, with, the, with the concept of the breath. The breath, not only is it necessary and fundamental, but it is the number one instrument that you hold within your body to reduce your level of anxiety. And why? Because it taps into the parasympathetic nervous system, as Dr. Bauer had mentioned before, you see, because it's like driving a car. You got the sympathetic, you got the parasympathetic. Sympathetic, Dr. Bauer mentioned, you know, it's like gas to the pedal, you know, and, you know, prepares us to fight, to fight. To, or to freeze. And the parasympathetic really allows us to wind down, to calm down. And it interferes with the release of all those hormones that we don't necessarily want in our system long-term. 
because it produces aging and heart disease. Okay. So again, just be mindful, you know, of what is within our control, being mindful of preventative care, more importantly. And like Dr. Palton said, you know, I mean, being mindful of what we have inherited, okay, from our prior, you know, family of origin issues and separating and seeing what works and what doesn't work. All of it, all of it. Yeah. yeah and I'd like to just kind of tag on to what both Dr. Bauer and Dr. Diaz said and to answer the question that you asked Dr. T of how this all relates, especially to this experience that we've had with the pandemic and COVID. And so kind of like Dr. Diaz was just saying, what's in our control, what's out of our control. A lot of stuff was out of our control last year at the beginning of this pandemic. And a lot of us had to stay home and we were in lockdown. And so going back to my topic of intergenerational occurrences, you're at home with a family 24 seven, where before the pandemic, you at least could escape through work or through social outings with friends. And that was taken away from us. And so we saw a lot of conflict between families occur a lot more during this past year because of this dynamic that we did uh, to protect ourselves. Um, and so kind of going to Dr. Bauer's point of, you know, with children and having to do school at home virtually and parents working and conflicts get high and tempers get raised. And like you, my second question that I had answered earlier, you know, what do you do when someone talks down to you? What do you do when things get heated and there's conflict? And so especially in this, in this time, in this pandemic, it's, I think how Dr. Diaz said earlier, right? Trying to listen and validate and empathize and understand um, but also in the terms of children and parents, right? Parents can model the behavior they want to see from their child. So if their child's yelling at them, talking back to them, you know, they can resist that urge to scream or yell back at the child and instead talk to them in a very calm and respectful way. Again, using those I statements I brought up earlier um, and set clear boundaries. So, you know, that's what something you do have control of setting the boundaries and following through with them. So an example of that might be the parent saying to the child, you know, I know you feel mad, but if this conversation continues like this, I'm not going to respond and I'm going to step away. Um, and so that communication, even not only a parent-child dynamic, but a partner-to-partner -partner dynamic, um, adult-to-adult, um, when our views conflict, when we're just heated, stressed, whatever it may be, um, clear communication and clear boundaries, I think are so important to manage the daily stressors we're having, like Dr. Bauer said, at a macro level and a micro level. So let, let me add to that. Dr. Pompom, your dog was uh, right on cue. So <laughs> everyone knows how to fight. Everyone's good at discord. We're experts at it. Got it? individuals, families, governments, nations, just name it. Everyone's good at it. But who's good at de-escalating the problem? If you're leaving the house and you're coming back in, wipe the stuff off your feet on the mat before you walk into that house. Don't carry your stuff into your house to toxify everyone's good mood. You might be walking into a war. It's, I don't know your house all, but you have to learn not to contribute to it. Hang it on the tree. I think Dr. T, you said you had an example that you do something, but wipe the stuff off the mat. Do something so you stop and pause. I call practice the pause. You stop and pause for 10 seconds and you sort of collect yourself. If you didn't do it, another 10 seconds. You might be out there for half an hour. But pause. And one thing that Dr. Diaz said, which was very strong, anxiety is the stress. And we're trying to control what we can while everything around us is out of control. Got that? So you want to control the conversation. You want to control the fight. You want to control the outcome. Whether it's a child, adolescent, adult, doesn't matter. So you're going to battle for that control. If you're on the opposite end of that, don't fight back. Choose your battles wisely. And when someone's having anxiety, they're usually holding their breath, which is now increasing the pressure in their body and their nerve physiology is now reacting. So breathe, exhale, let go of that. 
Because most people with anxiety, and everybody has it, everybody has it, has to learn to exhale and release that valve. If you're going into your house and you're all stressed out, so you don't carry that in. Dr. Bauer, thank you so much. I mean, I love, I love your analogies once again, and particularly because you normalize the experience for so many people. You know, that's one statement about saying that everybody has anxiety is so spot on because a lot of people that do struggle with anxiety, they think they're the only ones, you see? You see? Only me, mm-hmm. you, know? you know? So it's, it's really important to understand that it's, it's to the degree in which it becomes either manageable or unmanageable. And I think Dr. T, you had mentioned, you know, when do you go seek help, you know? And, and how do you know, you know, the difference between anxiety and fear, you see, or anxiety and apprehension, whether it's biological or whether it's environmental. And it's simple, it's simple. If there is something in your immediate environment that is threatening you, then, you know, that adrenaline that comes up in your system is so perfectly healthy. It's actually protecting you, it's insulating you and preparing you to respond, you see? Without it, you'd be dead, all right? However, if there's nothing in your immediate environment that poses a threat and you are experiencing this adrenaline rush again and again, and it's compromising your activities of daily living, your sleeping, your eating, your interpersonal relationships, that's when you gotta take, like Dr. Bauer said, a pause, take a personal inventory and say, you know what? I need a third party. I need a third party in order to kind of help me understand what's going on, whether I need a medical clearance because there might be some physiological stuff going on or whether there might be some other emotional or psychological phenomenon that maybe is outside my blind spot. And Regardless I, of what it is, what are you gonna say, Dr. Dr. Bauer? I was just gonna, I, I, were you done? Yeah, I can. So Dr. Popham says, so sometimes we bring stuff from our family, paternal, father side of maternal in our family. So we have inherited, no, 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 we don't go to outside help. Our family has secrets, we keep them here. No, 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 psychotherapy, psychology, they're crazy, we're not gonna to talk to them. Now, I'm not injecting anything, I'm not taking medication, but meanwhile, they're gonna to go to a, a organic whole food to the organic food supply and buy some supplement to self-medicate to feel better, but they don't know what they're doing. So what did you inherit in your family? What did you marry into? What did you made into? Because you're carrying that and you don't even realize it. So do, do you need outside help? Do they need outside help? It's a good question. And I just like to go again love Dr. Bauer's analogies and with the whole pause for a minute, you know, for me, I also like to, I I practice that and it does make such a difference, but also adding like a physical component too. And there my dog goes again. So I apologize, but you know, like physically, like shake it off, like move your body, shake your body and like imagine the stress and whatever's bothering you falling off of you, changing clothes, right. Coming home and putting on a whole nother outfit that helps you feel more relaxed and at peace. Um, and to that intergenerational thing that Dr. Bauer just mentioned too, of she's not going to be quiet right now. I apologize. Um, but when we're at home and we see that, like Dr. Bauer said, oh, we don't go to therapists. We don't talk to psychiatrists. We don't take medication. So going back to that genogram, that family tree, that family information that can help us see you know, how did my family deal with conflict in the past when they were dealing with stressful times? might not have been a pandemic. How did they deal with it? Did they shut down? Did they cut themselves off from other people and stop talking to them? Or did they go and seek help from other people, from therapists, from friends? And those patterns might be repeating too. So you can see what happened and what do I want to do different that is in my control and create a new pattern for my family and future families. Let me add to a totem pole. On the totem pole, mental health treatment is on the bottom. You're going to take your dog to the vet, car to the mechanic, get your vitamins, get your alcohol and drugs, (laughs) buy something you don't need, and then you should go down. Oh, I need to go to medical doctor. It will go away as it gets worse. But mental health, nah, nothing's wrong. But everyone sees that something's wrong. 
Talk to your neighbors. I'm sure they know something's wrong. But for some reason, it's a stigma. But it's the healthiest approach, like Dr. Diaz said, mental hygiene is the most important factor in everything else. Because if you're not good mentally, you're not good. You may fake it for a while, but I guarantee you, everybody knows. They're just not telling you. All right. Well, very well said. Um, it sounds like uh, one of the main take home messages is that we're all kind of stressed right now and there's reason to be, but having an awareness of how our bodies react to stress, uh, the patterns that we have in our daily lives, as well as some of these intergenerational patterns that are learned through our interactions and observations with our parents, grandparents, and so forth, continue to impact us today. Um, and becoming aware of this also places the next challenge, which is doing something about it and hoping that we don't put mental health all the way at the bottom. So uh, things like what we're doing today, creating a dialogue for people to talk about these things is very, very important because as long as they're kept hidden, like those indicator lights are not really looked at, then you just kind of get worse over time. So making sure that we're raising awareness that these things do occur and there's things that can be done about that. Um, in the interest of time, I want to go ahead and start moving into our audience and their questions. So thank you everybody so much for everything so far. Uh, we'll move on to some questions from our audience at this time. Um, so let me see. We have one question uh, here. Um, so I have from Itzia. Uh, what would you recommend families that have a family member who's suffering from substance abuse? What are the best matters of communication to encourage your family members to get help? So when you have someone that is experiencing a significant uh, you know, condition or something like substance use, uh, how would you advise the family when maybe there is some of that inertia, Dr. Bauer, that you were saying that maybe they're still pushing mental health uh, to the bottom or things like substance use, well, that'll just resolve itself. So uh, is, who would like to uh, answer this question? Um, who would like to address this? I think Dr. Diaz might be a great answer, but hold on. Okay. Right in Dr. Pompum. I was like, oh, yeah, go ahead. It's self-medicating. They're drinking or taking something, but they really need something else. When a kid is taking Zanny bars, Xanax, they have, a, they have an underlying anxiety issue. When a kids in colleges are buying a Ritalin pill for $10, they have an attention deficit issue. So if you're drinking or eating or smoking or doing something, that means that you're trying to fix something that you know needs help. I call it self-medicating. Yeah. Hold on. The umbrella of substance use is not dealing with the underlying issue. Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, I, I, I agree 100%, you know, with uh, Dr. Bauer in the same vein. I also want to kind of underscore what Dr. Popham had said in terms of intergenerational kind of variables and effects, because there is the concept of hereditary predisposition. So you can have somebody, you know, pick up a cigarette and uh, never pick it up again. And then you could have somebody pick up a cigarette and be hooked, you see, because they have that in their, you know, uh, I guess in their bloodline, that addictive quality, you see. And so, you know, it's, it's important to understand that when an individual is struggling with substance use, it's not an individual's problem. It's a system's problem. You see, because you have many, many individuals within that actual system that whether consciously or unconsciously, they are kind of contributing to it, whether it's through enabling, you see, justifying, coddling, whatever it is. So, you know, what, what can you do, you know, in this case, you know, um, family meetings, and I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to segue over to Dr. Popham because that's her area of specialty. But uh, Dr. Popham, you might want to spring forward and talk a little bit maybe about some family meetings and what kind of rolls out during these meetings. Yeah, so for family meetings, especially with something like substance abuse or a severe mental health diagnosis, 
I think having the whole family or as many people as possible come together and talk because I think that can help if it's done the right way, it can help take away blame and finger pointing, right? That you are the problem and it's all you. Um, no, this is a systems problem, right? We're all affected, we're all influencing, we're all related in some way. Um, and that might go even beyond family, right? Friends, neighbors, coworkers. And so the more people you can have to come in and provide perspective, and it goes back to what Dr. Diaz said of listening to understand, right? Not to try and convince the other person necessarily to agree with you but to come to some common ground and some com common understanding that's so important. Um, and I know it might sound repetitive, but I think to the, the question that came from the chat of how do you have, you know, suggest to a family member that they might need help, they might need treatment, right? And for me, it's again, trying to go back to those I statements to not again, point the finger because that's most likely gonna make them feel defensive and say, no, I don't have a problem. I don't need to go to treatment or to therapy. But when you can let them know how you feel and your concerns from your standpoint without so much of the you, 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 I think you have a little bit better um, chance of success taking it from that approach. They're gonna be defensive. They're not going to respond well when you tell them about a problem they already know. But if they know that you're hurting from it because addictions destroy families and lives, then maybe they're more receptive to that. And if they're resistant and defensive, the family can always go to things like Al-Anon, which is support groups to understand how to cope with that and deal with it. And all of a sudden, if you're, now you're going to a, support group and your mate is using at home, they're going to see something's wrong because it's creating separation. But you're trying to figure out, how do I help this? I love you, but I don't love your behavior. And it's causing problems with us. And you don't want to do anything about it. So I'm going to do something about it. And, you know, it's beautiful that you say that because it only takes one person in most cases to change a family system. If that one person shifts, it creates ripple effects in the actual system itself. Yeah. All right. So we have another question. Uh, well, we have several questions, but now we have it from the, uh, as I like to say sometimes, the other side of the table. So from one of our clinicians that's watching the webinar, uh, they ask, uh, what can I do as a practicing therapist uh, to best support my clients with COVID-19 and distance from their families? Uh, with compassion, fatigue, and doing online therapy. So in the midst of quarantine and COVID-19, a lot of us have taken to telehealth. And so how do we as clinicians continue to provide the services that our patients and clients need and with compassion, uh, uh, fatigue being an issue? Yeah, so, I'll chime in, that's fine. Go balance. ahead, Dr. Diaz. <laughs> balance. And what, how, does, how do we define balance? Well, we're sitting in front of the screen 24 seven and that blue light is hitting us. It's binging us again and again and again. Sending those messages to our brain, right? Robbing us of the red light, right? Which lowers our progesterone, which lowers our serotonin levels, all of it. It's, there's a synergistic kind of component here. So we have to balance it out by going outside, getting some natural lighting, exercising, Going back to mental health hygiene, this is not just for our patients. As a practicing clinician, and I teach this to students in mental health practicum, you gotta practice what you preach. You gotta live your truth, right? You gotta live what you expect your, their, um, your, um, your clients to do, right? I'm not gonna go ahead and advocate you know, for meditation if I don't do it. You know, I'm not gonna go ahead and advocate for exercise if I don't participate in it. I'm not gonna advocate for the pause if I don't do it. Granted, we're all human. However, we have to be mindful that this is a very unique situation and we need to take steps in order to offset some of the artificial environments that have been created as a byproduct of the pandemic. So yeah. a very good answer, Dr. Diaz. Uh, I wanna go ahead and move on to the next question uh, because it brings us back uh, to the overall topic about relationships 
And this question specific uh, to some of the barriers that have been pressed upon us by COVID-19 and quarantine, uh, recommendations for dating through this pandemic. So I know Dr. Bauer, you talked about courtings uh, isn't what it used to be, um, but what advice can we give to some of our viewers and potentially some of the clinicians to advise their own clients as far as dating amidst everything that's going on? Uh, so dating during the pandemic, uh, any recommendations you can uh, offer our audience and viewers? I can, I can start. So I think it is hard because dating in this pandemic, especially if we want to follow all the guidelines put in place to keep ourselves and others safe, it changes how people date, how people interact and socialize. Um, and kind of going a little counter to what Dr. Diaz was bringing up earlier of the technology, right? And always being on our phone or Zoom or FaceTime. Yes, we need to have a balance with that, but that's actually where this comes into a positive for uh, dating or socializing, where you can, you know, meet people and start talking to them through texts, through phone calls, through video chats, and getting to know them on that personal level. Now, it's probably not exactly the same as in person, but it's something that we have in place that keeps us very, very safe, um, you know, from COVID. Um, and I've seen a bunch of commercials out there, too, for those dating sites that are advocating that of showing how they're having sharing pizza on a Zoom call or a FaceTime with someone new that they're interested in and talking to. Um, you know, we the the um, data and the research says that being outside open air, open air areas is safer, too. So, you know, if you decide to meet in person, meeting outside at a park, keeping socially distanced, you know, those are some ways you can still connect and meet someone and date someone, but still maintain uh, safety precautions. Okay. If you're dealing with the adolescent population, they don't know how to date. So you have to teach them the proper steps because they don't know how to initiate properly. They don't know how to follow through. And then if it doesn't work, then they get dumped. So you have to teach them how relationships actually should go because they're learning it from somewhere, but they're learning it wrong. Okay. So help them. Go on, Dr. Uh, no, I was just going to say, just going back to what Dr. Poplin was saying about modeling, how important that is, you see. And it, it all starts in the home you know, with the parental influence. So if you have somebody who is socially responsible and who's practicing universal precautions, it's going to trickle down, you know, to their children, you say. You can only plant seeds. You can only plant seeds. Okay. Um, so in the interest of time, I guess we'll start wrapping up. Um, so uh, if you guys want to provide any summary or closing statement, <laughs> Anything you guys want to add as far as, you know, what's your take home message? So, uh, Dr. Diaz, let's start with you. Uh, uh, what would you say is your take home message to our audience? Um, yeah, Dr. T, the biggest takeaway here is prevention. You don't have to wait, as Dr. Bauer mentioned, you know, for something to break down, you know, whether it be at the individual level or the systemic level. You don't. You want to take care of yourself because that's the biggest gift that you can actually give to someone else, you see. So prevention and awareness and just put it into practice. That's the biggest takeaway for me. Okay, very good. Uh, Dr. Paul, the same question to you. Any takeaways for us? Yeah, I think the main takeaway, especially with families and intergenerational occurrences is to be able to understand your family and accept your family and what has happened in the past. And you can't change other people, but by knowing more about your family and knowing, knowing more about your past, you're better able to change yourself and respond differently to your family members, even if they're not willing to change, that you can change. Um, and really holding on to that, that the more you try and make someone else change, the harder it's going to be for everyone. But being aware of other people and how they respond and how they are and using that to reflect on yourself and change yourself, I think that's the best place to start and really focus on overall. Okay. 
So let, let's tie it all together. Everything's a system. Neurophysiology, neurotransmitters, autonomic, sympathetic, parasympathetic. Your family is a system. The school system is a system. Your town is a system. Your car is a system. So we're dealing with dysfunctional situations in dysfunctional systems. The whole world is dysfunctional now because we're in a pandemic. So everyone is reacting to the system breakdown. Either you contribute to it and cause more problems or you facilitate functional lifestyle and management skills to make it work because the system needs to work. If it's breaking down, it's gonna break down and then you have more psychopathology. But if you understand you have the power to contribute and facilitate or tear down and rip apart, you become a change agent in that system. If you need help, go seek it. If, you're, if your spouse doesn't want help, go seek it. <laughs> Reach out to others because they can help you. Don't ignore it because if you hear a little ting, 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 ting in your car and you ignore it, that's a 25 cent piece. If you ignore it six months later, you have now a $4,000 repair shop at your car. Got it? But most people ignore it because they think it's going to go away. But don't ignore the system. The person that's acting out is, is, is a product of the system. They're, they're the identified issue. Be the helper, not the problem. Okay, so... Uh, it sounds like when we're looking to immunize our relationships and essentially ourselves, um, it's not at the point of infection or afterwards. It starts with prevention, uh, living a lifestyle that has hygiene embedded in it every day, uh, being aware of not just ourselves, but of intergenerational components, patterns that influence us, even when we don't know we're being influenced. And then finally, uh, we're all part of the system um, that, you know, changing a system starts with uh, a change within ourselves and uh, alluding to the man in the mirror, which is one of my favorite songs. Uh, it really starts with you. So um, I, I really like that example. Um, I want to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Diaz, Dr. Palmer, Dr. Bauer for an amazing webinar. Uh, I thank you so much for sharing your expertise and important information. Uh, to our audience, uh, thank you everyone who logged in, participated. Um, for anyone interested in additional resources related to the topics we discussed, the Albizu Clinic offers couples and marriage and family therapy via telehealth services at an affordable cost, and no health insurance is required. So go ahead and please visit uh, clinic.albizu.edu for more information. And please share this video with others who may be interested or who would benefit from this information. Um, so I want to wish everyone a great afternoon. Please stay safe. And let's keep uh, raising the awareness, okay? So thank you all. Indeed. Bye, thank everybody. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. -bye,